Well, there's another short section here that Paul's talking about belief driving behavior, and it's verses 6 through 10, and it gets into uh, finances. What our, what our belief drives behavior in regard to finances. Look at verse 6. Now there is great gain in godliness with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world. We cannot take anything out of the world. But that first phrase, there is great gain in godliness with contentment. He didn't say with finances. He said with contentment. Remember how I said that God has provided for our family in a variety of different ways? That sometimes financially we have been in a very desperate situation. And I can think of at least two examples. I'll, I'll, I'll mention one where we had a medical bill that we needed to pay. It was coming due. And it was several hundred dollars. And we're like, Lord, we're, we don't know what to do here. Do we need to borrow some money? Because we want to pay this bill on time and we can't. And a friend of mine came to me one day and he handed me the, some money and it was almost the exact amount of money of this medical bill. And he said, you know, God has been prompting me to do something with this little extra money that we have for the last two or three months. And he says, I wanted to and I never really got around to it. But he said, my wife and I sat down and we decided we were going to give part of this money to you. Does this help you? And I said, does it help us? It's within a few dollars of the exact amount we need. You see, but if my driving focus had been on money instead of my relationship with Jesus Christ, like, Lord, what do you want? We are at your disposal. We're trying to serve you. We want to be the kind of people you are. Then God provided. He said, it's not about the money. It is about the, the pursuit of godliness with contentment. You say, Lord, I am content with where we are right now. Understanding, as he says in verse 7, we brought nothing into this world. We can take anything out of the world. It makes me think of Job, who was a very wealthy man, who had a large family, lots of flocks and herds. One of the most respected men is that the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I've done a lot of funerals with, with, of people in our church over the years. No one takes any possessions with them. Nothing. No one. He says, I want you to find contentment in the fact that you are living a godly life. Verse 8, but if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But, but, but Lord, I, I need to retire in 20 years. But, but Lord, we, we need a better house. But, but Lord, we need a, a, an education for our children and we can't afford. He says, do you have food and clothing? And I look at our family and I say, yes, we do. We have plenty of food and we have plenty of clothing. He says, listen, if you have godliness and you have a life that is able to be sustained, that your, your, your family and your children have food and clothes, he says, then you have a reason to be content. I think of the Apostle Paul who in a different letter, in the letter to the Philippians, chapter 4, verses 11 to 13 said this, I am not saying this because I am in need. For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through Him who gives me strength. I can do everything, not because of my strength, not because of my money, not because of my power but I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength, who gives me strength. Henry David Thoreau, who was an 1800s naturalist, said this, A man is wealthy in proportion to the number of things he can do without. A man is wealthy in proportion to the number of things he can do without. I look at our home and I look at our life of our family and I say, you know, sometimes it gets to be about too much stuff. But sometimes I just long for it to be simple. And he says, I, I wonder if in the simplicity of following Christ that we can find much greater contentment. Look at what he continues his thought in verse 9. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, 
into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. If you remember back in verse 4, the different steps of progression down, here he lists some more for you. He says, I, I'm starting out with a person who says, I want to be rich. Maybe you're a university student and you say, you know, one day I hope to have a large home and two vehicles and a wonderful family and lots of money in the bank. He says, those who desire to be rich fall into temptation. It nibbles at the edges. It says, you know, if I could only have this, if I could only do that, then I would be satisfied. From temptation, it says it falls into a snare. I remember when we were, at, my brother and I were little boys, there was a, an animal in our backyard. We weren't sure if it was a gopher or a larger thing like a badger. And there was a hole in the ground. And so we got a little rope and we made a circle and threw a loop. And we stood back and hoped that the animal would poke its head out of the hole. And then we would pull on the rope. And that would be a snare. We never caught it. It never came back up out of the hole. But he said, temptation, when it entices us, then it becomes a snare that tries to grab us. What happens after that? Into a snare and then into many senseless and harmful desires. All of a sudden, our desires take us off into these many directions. And he says it ends up plunging people into ruin and destruction. I think of King David. In many ways, King David did so much good that he made one, at least one huge mistake. He should have been out at war, and he decided to stay back. And he goes out on the, the upper chamber of his palace, or the, the place where he could look over the city, and he looks down and he sees Bathsheba taking a bath. The temptation entered his eyes. It went to his mind, and he inquired, and he said, Who's that? And the leaders around him said, Well, that's Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, one of your soldiers. From his mind, it went to his heart, and he said, bring her to me. And his leader said, David, do you understand what you're asking? This is my paraphrase. You can't do that. Bring her to me. It affected his heart, and sin took up root in his heart, and he acted upon that, and he had relations with her. And she got pregnant, and it led him to, to murder her husband. And God convicted him of that through the prophet Nathaniel, and said, Daniel, or David, what have you done? You have sinned. For, for those of us who live in a Western culture, or, or even here where you are, the pursuit of financial means and financial status is so overwhelming because everybody is in the pursuit of this thing. In, in America, we live in a capitalistic society. And in many ways, capitalism is good because it teaches us to work hard. But at the same time, capitalism also says you can have anything if you just work hard, if you just do this, if you just do that often at the expense of other people. And, and, and Paul is saying to us, no, that's not how the Christian life is to be lived. Look at verse 10. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. He doesn't say that money is the root of evil. Money is just a tool. He says the love of money, the pursuit of money, the desire for money, the hunger for money is the root of all kinds of evils. Back at home, we have a large garden. Uh, and we share it with some friends of ours. It, it's their property, and he invited us to share a garden with him. So a few days before I came here to Russia, we went out to the garden and just looked things over, and some things were ready for harvest. But whenever I go to the garden, the one thing I see is weeds. I don't like weeds. I, I wish our garden would have zero weeds. So I go down, and when you get a weed, you don't simply tear off the top or the weed is going to grow again. What you do is you go and I take my hands down right at the bottom and I squeeze and I pull it up because I want to get the roots. If I don't get the roots, the weed is just going to keep growing and growing and growing. And what Paul is saying here, he says, is the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. You can see the evidence of it on top here, but he says way down under the ground, it actually gives root to all kinds of different evil and sin. He says this, It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Belief drives behavior. Belief 
drives behavior and it affects relationships. That's what these first few verses are about. But belief drives behavior when it comes to our finances. I wonder how sad it made Paul to write those last few words. It's as if he's saying, you know, I know this person and that person who essentially said, you know, being a poor Christian is not the way I want to live my life. I can't be poor. I want to have things. I want to have possessions. And you say, I would never be like that. But I'm not so sure because sometimes in my life I, I, I find myself saying, if I only had this or if I only had that, and our children notice these things too, and they say, why can't we have this like this friend has? This friend has a boat, or this friend has a snowmobile, or this, this friend has uh, more computers, or, or nicer iPod, or, or nicer things like that. Dad, why can't we have that? Part of my heart gets sad because I'm not able to give them everything they want. And then I'm reminded that godliness is a means of great gain. That the pursuit of finances and the pursuit of money distracts us from the gospel. And as Paul concludes this section, I, I think there's just a sadness in his heart as I think he's thinking of names that would say they have wandered away from the truth. They have wandered away from the gospel emphasis in their lives. Let me ask you a question. I asked you to look at your relationships, the three or four or five closest friends you have. What does your your relationship, your friendship with them say about your relationship to God. Now let me ask you a second question. I want you to look at your viewpoint on finances, on money, right now. I want to ask you, what does that say about your view of God? Are you always wishing for more? Are you always wishing that it was something different? Or are you able to find contentment in where God has you now? I know it would always be a little bit better if we had a little bit more, maybe. Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, teach the people to be focused on the gospel of Jesus Christ and let the belief that God is sufficient and Christ is sufficient, that if you have food and clothing, that you can find great contentment and that the greatest source of your pleasure is going to be your godliness and your relationship with God through Jesus Christ and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And in that, you will find a richness that is beyond finances. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TFS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, visit www.tvseminary.com. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.